Oh, there it is. Well, good morning. Going to be in the prophet Jeremiah this morning, chapter 23. And my sermon title this morning is, Oh Lord, Give Us Shepherds. There is a worldwide need for shepherds in every sphere of life. And as I'm going to talk about this morning, there are different kinds of shepherds. There are shepherds, biblically, in the civil realm. For example, David was called from shepherding literal, physical, four-legged sheep to shepherd his people Israel. He was called to be a king. And the analogy of a shepherd to a civil magistrate Um, applies to that office as king. And then there is the obvious shepherd of the church. Many times in the New Testament, um, shepherd analogy is used of pastors and teachers and overseers of the flock of God. But by extension, I would say there's also the role of shepherding that's to be found in the home. And that one's not quite as obvious, but when God's Word speaks of the qualifications of someone to be a pastor in the church, where does it say to look? It says to look at his home, that his household must be in order. Now, why is that? Because shepherding in the home is a proof that a person has the ability to shepherd in the church. So if a pastor's family is out of whack, totally out of order, uh, that doesn't mean that everything's perfect, we're all sinners, and oftentimes I read that passage, and it's a very humbling passage because I feel the weight of it, and my own shortcomings, and my own failures, my own sins, my own repeated offenses, but that, that is the standard, and what that tells me is that fathers, mothers to a degree also, are called to shepherd their children. Their children need shepherding. What does a shepherd do? In Psalm 23, what does the good shepherd do? Well, he he leads the sheep. He feeds the sheep. He disciplines the sheep. He protects the sheep from enemies. He anoints the, 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 the head of the sheep, implying medicinal healing of the sheep. So that looks differently in different spheres. This is what a shepherd does. He doesn't just have a bunch of sheep and put them out in a fence. A shepherd's not a cowboy. Cowboys will drive their cattle, but a shepherd, sheep, sheep need a lot more care. You know when the psalmist David says, you restore my soul in Psalm 23. A sheep will get into a low place and fall over on its back with its feet in the air, and it will die there. It needs someone to come along and lift it up and set it on its feet again. If that sheep is left to itself, it will die. A sheep will, uh, when, when you go to slay a sheep, they, they barely, I mean, they'll bleat a little bit. They don't run, they don't fight, they don't bite. Now a ram, a ram will, will protect the ewes and the lambs of the, of the herd by maybe butting something. But overall, sheep are helpless animals and they need a shepherd And Jesus refers to us as his sheep. Without him, we can do nothing. He's the good shepherd. Without him, we will die. We need him to restore our soul. If it was left up to us, we would never make it. We would never come, and we would never stay. But because we have a good shepherd, his sheep know his voice. The Father draws them, they come to them, and and nothing will pluck us out of his hand. It's good to know that... Jesus is the good shepherd, and we are his sheep. Well, we need shepherds in every sphere. And so I want to read to you uh, from from Jeremiah chapter 23 this morning. If you would stand with me for the reading of God's word, we'll read Jeremiah chapter 23. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold. 
and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will declare, de- dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. Yahweh Tzidkenu, the Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought us up, the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he has driven them. Then they shall dwell in their own land. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. Because of the curse, the land mourns and the pastures of the wilderness are dried up. Their course is evil and their might is not right. Both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their evil, declares the Lord. Therefore their way shall be to them like slippery paths in the darkness, into which they shall be driven and fall. For I will bring disaster upon them in the year of their punishment, declares the Lord. In the prophets of Samaria I saw an unsavory thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. But in the prophets of Jerusalem I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with bitter food and give them poison water to drink. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has gone out into all the land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? And who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold the storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. You may be seated. Now, I'm aware that this is a very long passage. And what's more is there are many, many allusions to it. Because the shepherd analogy is so full of the scriptures. So what I'll do is occasionally, I won't go and look at those scriptures in depth, but a couple of them. And I'll, I'll, I may allude to some of the other scriptures. But I'm going to go through it rather, rather speedily because it's a long chapter. And I want to get the main point of the passage. And, and um, here we see at the end, he, he also applies this to prophets. The prophets had a responsibility. They were the covenant enforcers of the Old Testament. When God had uh, had a, a cause against the people of Israel, the prophet's job was to go and to bring the indictment and to bring them back into the fold. They they fulfilled that role in Psalm 23. The Lord's staff, rod and staff, they comfort me. The rod was for beating off the wolves. And the staff was for pulling that erring sheep back into the fold. Now the rod was a comfort because a sheep is no match for a wolf or a lion or a bear. But the staff 
or the rod rather, now the staff, the shepherd's crook, the candy cane looking thing, that was a comfort to the sheep because the sheep knows that left to himself he would surely be lost. The sheep is aware that if, it, if it's left up to me, I know my own heart, it's often wandering, it's often wanting to go off stray. And th- this is why uh, without the Lord, without His Spirit, you'll never make it. But the good news is, is that as God's people, we have a good shepherd. And He cares for His sheep and He lays down His life for the sheep. But how does He, how does he bring us back in line? Well, he uses shepherds in various spheres. They all have a role in the civil sphere, in the church, and in the family. We need each other. You'll meet Christians and say, well, I don't need the church. I just need me and Jesus, my Bible, and I, I can go worship God in a, in a tree stand, or I can go worship out on the lake. I can take a walk in nature and commune with God. Let me tell you, that is a very dangerous position to take. Because even pastors need shepherds. That's why there's a plurality of elders in the church. Because we all need accountability. We all need people in our life who can speak into our life, who can come to us, hopefully with humility, but it's not always going to be with humility because we go to church with sinners. But we need people in our lives. And I'm I'm just talking about elders. I'm talking about fellow congregants. People that we spend time with, we talk about God, we talk about what He's doing in His life, we, we talk about His Word, and we sharpen each other, and we remind each other, and we build each other up, and we pray for one another, and we serve one another. We do the one another's of Scripture. Sheep need the flock, and the flock needs shepherds. We can also talk about this in, in, in the civil realm. Um, now, it's not the role of the shepherd to stuff the grass in the sheep's mouth. Uh, what, does the, what does the shepherd do? Well, the shepherd protects the sheep from predators. They, they protect them. And in the civil realm, this is the most important role of civil government, is to protect people from evildoers. That's what Romans 13 says, that the, the civil magistrate does not bear the sword in vain. Why does he have the sword? To, to execute vengeance on the evildoers. By, by punishing the murderer and the rapist and putting them out from among us, it makes society safer. Now, I had a guy tell me one time, he's like, well, if the Bible teaches service, you sure don't see it much. And I'm like, really? Do you realize that at the time this was written, the world, how did they refer to their civil rulers? They referred to them as, you know, the, the Greek word despotes. We get the word despot from it. The, the word... Um, uh, imperator, the emperor. They referred to him as their father. They referred to him as the gift giver. They had a very, sometimes a, a socialist view of the government at times. But they were like little g gods. If, if, the, if the emperor, or the king, or the pharaoh said you lived, you lived. If he said you die, you died. And he could be totally whimsical about it. Like, like to this day in communist China. Whatever she says, if, if I, I, was, I was listening to somebody talk about how he doesn't really know what's going on in the world because all of his advisors are scared to tell him the truth about certain problems in China. Everybody's scared of their president because he might have them and their family killed or taken off and put in prison. That is a pagan view of civil government. But you'll notice in Romans 13, it says that he is the deacon of God to you for good. He is, a, he is the servant, the minister of God to you for good. He has a limited function. He himself is under authority. Let every soul be subject to the powers that be. So Nero has a soul. Let Nero also be subject to plural authorities, right? He has a limited function, a limited role. He's not your savior. He's not your Messiah. He's not your daddy. He has a limited role. But by punishing evildoers, it's safe to walk in the street. Now this concept, you see it, whether it's lived out or not. What do you see written on the side of almost every police car? To protect and serve. That is, a, that is a Christian view of civil government. Now you can argue all day about to what degree does the police force live up to it. But I'll tell you one thing. It looks a lot different than the Roman soldier in the first century. That if he wanted something, he just took it. From somebody that wasn't a citizen, they were bullies. They, were, they weren't just a police force. They were an occupying force. 
The world has been changed by the concept of servant leadership. And the family, the idea that husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Do you realize, ladies, how revolutionary of an idea that is? That is a Christian concept. The idea that husbands should love their wives and care for them and wash them in the water of the word. Um, it, still, it still says that women should submit to their husbands. The Bible still teaches that. But, but the concept of servant leadership is, is a Christian concept that has made its way into our, our vocabulary. We speak of civil servants. That is, a, that is, an, that is an implication of a biblical idea. It's a, it's a biblical truth that has made its way into the culture. And we've experienced human flourishing like no time in history. The greater this ideal of shepherding is put into force in the family, in the church, in the state, the more God's people will multiply and flourish and prosper. Because when you have in the civil order a just society where evil is restrained, people are free to be creative and to cooperate and to take more of their money and put it into having dominion over land instead of having dominion over people. It's a beautiful thing. We need shepherds with shepherd's heart in the civil realm. In the church also, we had the Lagogi family over earlier this week and it was heartbreaking to me. It's not that we don't have the same problem here in America, but it's to perhaps a greater degree where the shepherds are making merchandise of the flock of God. And what breaks me, my heart the most about it, from what the reports I heard, is the people are so hungry for the Word of God. Not like it is here. People are hard towards the Word of God. They're hard towards the gospel. Americans right now, for the most part, are arrogant and don't have the heart in Africa. They're so ripe. The harvest is so ripe. People are so hungry. They'll give their, their last dollars to the church and then the pastors take it and they build humongous churches. That are, I heard about a church that's three miles wide and three miles long. They're, they're, not, they're not shearing the sheep. They're fleecing the flock. And it breaks my heart. Oh God, raise up righteous shepherds that will care for the sheep and Africa will flourish like it's never seen in history. You know, people point to the greatness of, of Egypt and the pyramids. I see the pyramids and yes, it is an architectural wonder. We don't even know how they did it. But I can't help but think about what at that time and energy had been put into the people in that time for human flourishing. Would they have had, with the same brilliance, would they have had hot and cold running water and flush toilets, better sanitation, longer life expectancy? Would, would, they, would they have been able to, to live in air-conditioned housings if, if that... If that that uh, energy had been put into cooperation and serving their fellow man. I tell you, Africa, I believe one day will flourish greater than it has ever done in the past. But it's going to take godly shepherds. Where? In the home, in the civil realm, and in the church. First, perhaps, the church. Because the church becomes the pattern that is lived out in the home. And the home makes up the people who will one day fill the offices in the church. And eventually, the mentality of the church makes its way into the civil realm, and it changes the social order. Now notice, it doesn't start top down, it starts bottom up, it, it starts inside out. The kingdom of Christ is an inside out kingdom. You change the heart of men and you will change their family and you will change their community. You will change their church. You will change the social order around them because people will start to demand justice. Who demanded the end of the slave trade? People with a Christian conscience. You realize that slavery has been practiced on every continent and every age of history and still is to this day practice. In the Congo, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of slaves mining the cobalt for your cell phones and your electric cars. Now, today, right now, right now there are slaves. Right now there are people in China that you may not call slaves, but they are slaves of the communist government. 
But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. It's an inside-out kingdom, though. You cannot go into a country, say Iraq, and say, we're going to impose liberty on you. We are going to make you a free people. I said it 20-something years ago. I'll say it now. People do not yearn for freedom. They yearn most for a Savior. And if all they have is the state, they will look to the state and they will look to tyranny. It takes looking to Christ. When people, you know the most powerful prayer that can be prayed to change the social order? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why is that powerful? Because men start to look to God as their father and God as their provider. They cease looking to men and they cease looking to government programs which fleece the flock. And then they start to serve one another and cooperate. And guess what? God gives them their daily bread and eventually their daily steak too. It's an inside out kingdom. You can't change it from the outside in. It makes very little difference who is elected to office in the next term in comparison to the spiritual condition of the people. You change the the mentality of the individual to one of the greatest among you shall be your servant. It will change the individual. It will change the home. It will change business. Interesting enough, uh, the the businesses that serve people best become the best businesses until they start and still they, they start taking shortcuts and name brands that used to be great name band, brands known for, for having good products that lasted decades. They start making things that are designed to washers and dryers and refrigerators that last about eight years and they break down. They say, well, they'll have to come back to us to get another one. Totally different mentality of whatever you do. Do all to the glory of God. Create a great product. Serve your customer well. It's a different mentality. It's not a Christian mentality. The Christian mentality is do it to the Lord. Work is unto the Lord. And when you create that kind of environment of of covenant keeping and honesty and keeping your word and serving people, there's human flourishing. But it's the result of the good shepherd coming into humanity. Okay, let's go. Let's get into our text now. Verse 1. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares Yahweh. Woe, Woe to the shepherds. God is very angry with that type of shepherd. Now, Jesus is the head of the church. We know that. But did you know that he's also the king of kings and the Lord of lords? That means he's the, he's the authority. Caesar is supposed to be his minister. Romans 13 says that he is the minister of God. He is the deacon of God to you for good. He serves God before he serves the people. He doesn't hearken to the voice of the people like Saul did. Saul hearkened to the voice of the people. Democracy, democracy. No, his highest job is to do what God tells him, not to do what the masses, the mob tells him. Mobocracy, our founding fathers called it, where where the mob rules. The mob says, we want what the 1% has. And the 1% says, I can buy off politicians and manipulate the multitudes. Not a biblical view either way, right? Well, God says, I'm against those shepherds, and we need good shepherds. Now, I'm going to quickly read three, three things from John 10 to make a connection. In John 10, Jesus, alluding to this passage and others that speak of sheep, says, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand is not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. 
I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of his fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd, one flock, one shepherd made up of Jew and Gentile, male and female, barbarian, Scythian, bond and free, one, one flock. God's bringing the nations together under one shepherd. This idea that there'll be one flock. What do we call the one flock? It has a name. It's the church. The church. Ecclesia. Out called. He's, he's gathered together sheep from every tongue, tribe, and nation. He will continue to. The job is not over yet. He is not. The Great Commission is still being accomplished. The gospel is still going out. To all nations. And God's gathering together. And they're going to be one flock. Say, well, you know, maybe, maybe people think, oh, the United Nations or some kind of peace treaty is going to bring world peace. The only thing that can bring world peace is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the mentality that comes with it that we're called to serve one another and love one another and do one another good. That, that's the only, thing that can, the, the only thing that can unify people truly from the inside out is the gospel that, that makes a man a new creature in Christ Jesus. But there's a great need for shepherds who are like the good shepherd. And he makes it clear. He says the, the good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. But there are other shepherds out there that they look out and instead of seeing a precious flock of God, they see meat. Just a bunch of meat. And the more meat, the better. And they want to eat the, they want to, they don't want to just shear the sheep. They want to, they want to fleece the sheep. And God hates it. God hates it. It's not the role. It's, it's not, it's not like Christ. Not for the civil realm, not for the church, and not for, not for uh, this, the, uh, the family as well. God calls us to love and to serve. Let's go on to verse 2 of Jeremiah 23. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Now look what he says about him. He says that those shepherds, um, they, they, uh, their, their job is to care for his people. That's their role, is to care for the people. But instead, they've scattered the flock. They, they wanted the titles, they wanted the income, but they didn't care for the sheep. And so the sheep became scattered. Now, what's so bad about scattered sheep living independent lives? Well, again, sheep are not, sheep need the flock and sheep need the shepherd. If a sheep is isolated, it will be eaten. In fact, what a wolf will often, often do, I've been told, is as a flock moves along, a wolf will will come in out of the woods and will nip a sheep at his heels. So there's a wound. And he doesn't want to get the ram rammed him. So he'll come out and he'll quickly bite the one that's the furthest behind. And then as the, the flock moves along and progresses with the shepherd, the one falls further and further behind. And eventually it's easy prey for the wolf. He's just, there's no ram around. There's no shepherd around. And, and this, this concerns me in the church. We have to be so careful about backbiting. Wolves backbite. And what happens is people get wounded. They get wounded in their heart. And they, they start to feel wounded. And instead of the church being a place of healing, a place of nurture, a place of growth, a wound, they think, oh, I, it's just a little wound. It's not a big deal. And they, they start to trail. They start to get isolated. They come less and less. They get isolated. And they're an easy prey for the enemy. That's why backbiting is a much more serious sin than people realize because it wounds sheep and they get isolated and they become a prey. If, if you think that backbiting and gossip and, and destructive talk is less serious than, say, pornography or something like that, you are very wrong. It's like, it's like an, akin to the murder of souls. It's a, it's a violent act spiritually. If we could see it from a spiritual vantage point, we would see exactly how, how dangerous it is. That's why shepherds, as painful as it is, it, you have to, we have to confront it 
You have to deal with it when it comes in your midst. When there's division in the flock and there starts to be a separation and there's alienation of feelings, there's hurt feelings, and the sheep starts to fall aside, the, the flock gets scattered, people become an easy prey for the enemy. That's why it's very important that we have a heart for the body of Christ, the local church. We have to have a heart for every person. And people will offend you, and it, it's a glory for a man to pass over a transgression. But we have to also be careful of, of the bitterness that sometimes takes root in the heart and later it will it'll, uh, it'll manifest itself. Be very careful. And so the, the, the sheep are getting scattered. Why is that a big deal? Because they're getting eaten when they get scattered. They get eaten. And then verse 3 says, Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, And I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. God says, I will gather them. I think of, I think it's a Luke 11, 23 from memory. He says that you're either with me or you're against me. You either gather with me or you scatter. Everybody in the body, you're either helping to build up the church, to edify the church, to gather the church, or you're scattering the church. And you're either with him or you're against him. We are are to be very careful as the flock of God how we treat one another because it's his flock for whom Christ died. It's not a trivial thing to drive away the flock of God. So, uh, but, but But when they're gathered back, when they're gathered and they're healthy and they're flourishing and there's a good shepherd, what happens? They become fruitful and they multiply. And in the civil realm... Industry takes place and businesses flourish and creativity finds, finds cooperative people together and, they, and, and great things happen. In the church, when the church is in harmony and people are loving one another and they, they love the visitor and they love, they love the lost and they love their neighbors, when the body is healthy, multiplication takes place. Two healthy people in a marriage, living in a relationship, have children, a healthy body of believers doing the one another's of Scripture, doing life together, involved in each other's lives, the Lord will add to that church. The Lord will do it, and He'll he'll add to the people. In fact, you can't stop it from happening. They will be fruitful and multiply. They will will fulfill the dominion mandate of Genesis 1.27 to be fruitful and multiply. God gave a promise to Abraham in Genesis 12.3 that he would make his, his, his seed, his descendants, as the sand by the seashore and the stars of heaven for multitude. That is yet to be fulfilled. It's being fulfilled. We're in the process of it. Great multitudes of people in the underground church coming to faith in Christ. It was great. The other night we had a dance here and to talk to a young man who's from China. And I asked him, what kind of church does he go to? Does he go to the Three Self Church? He's like, oh, that's, you know, that's the state church. I go to, he, he called it a family church. They meet in secret in homes. They meet, you know, that, that, that's what they do. That's what he came from. God's doing a work in China. God's doing a work in Africa. God's doing a work in South America. He's adding to his church. And one of the things necessary is good shepherds that give their life for the sheep. We need good shepherds. And when that takes place, they will be fruitful and they will multiply and they will fill the earth. Verse 4. He says, I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, now shall neither, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. The shepherds, when, when, when we're looking out for the flock, they're not going to be missing. Why is there such, why are there so many children leaving the Christian faith? Like 87% or something like that. It may be an old statistic and it may be off. I don't know. I don't know true numbers. I don't even know how they measure that. But there is a a staggering number of children that get to college and they say, I don't want to be a Christian. Why is that? I think there's a lack of shepherding. There's a lack of shepherding in the home. We got it. We got to shepherd. Fathers, the, the responsibility does not fall on a Sunday school. It falls on you. I'm excited about this Bible reading program we've started. I still want to encourage you, if it's too much to read all of Genesis up to chapter 19 now, we're in chapter 19, um, it's okay. Start in chapter 20. Start where we're at. Today, actually, is Psalm uh, 5 through 8. We're reading as a church. 
But something I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do, much better job of myself, is, is uh, open up with my kids sometime before they go to bed and read the New Testament passage. And I've been really pleased this week. Uh, I know beginnings are always enthusiastic, but my kids are like, oh, I read it this morning. I'm like, great, we'll, we'll read it again. We'll talk about it. And there were, there were some days we were so tired and it was so late. We just, we just read it and that was it, went to bed. But it's one chapter, one chapter. Actually, it was less, last night it was only 15 verses of Matthew 5. But it falls to you. I, I, I do not believe that it is normal for children to lose their, their for, for families to lose their children to the world. I don't think that's normal. I think we've come to see it as expected because it's what we see around us. But something's wrong. Something's wrong. We've got to fix that. And w- one hour a week with, with a crossword puzzle on Sunday morning is not going to cut it. You've got to disciple your children. Where are we going to get more church shepherds? It's going to come from the family shepherds. It's going to come from, from families. Now, not everybody who's a good father is called to be a shepherd in the church. It's, not, it's a calling. If any man desires the office of overseer, he desires a good work, or bishop or pastor. He desires a good work. Got to have a desire. We can't make somebody be a pastor who doesn't have a heart to do that or a calling to do that. There's not, not every godly man is called to be an, an elder in the church or even a deacon. We need Christians in the, in the civil realm, in the business realm, in every realm. But the heart of a shepherd is needed in every sphere. There's a place for shepherds. Okay, verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he shall be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Now, Yahweh said, Kenu, the Lord is our righteousness. This is a messianic prophecy. This is talking about Jesus. In fact, when Matthew says that he shall be called a Nazarene, two different theories about what is said there, because there is no verse that says he shall be called a Nazarene in the Old Testament. But Matthew is... Playing a, either way, he's playing a little bit of a word game. The word Nazareth um, could be referring to uh, a Nazarite, and it's alluding to Samson being a Nazarite. Samson was called to save his people from the Philistines. Jesus is called to save his people from their sins. So that's, that is a, a very interesting possibility that very well may be true. But the other thing is, is Nazar, Nazareth, Netzer in Hebrew, means branch. He shall be called a Nazarene. He's, he's showing that, look, he comes from Nazareth, and the name of the town means branch. Jesus is the righteous branch that Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Jeremiah 23, verse 5, is referring to. Jesus is the branch. Or as Isaiah 53 says, the root out of dry ground. Several places are called the branch. He's a branch that comes out of the house of David, he, he, who, who was a king, by the way. That's the civil role there. And he shall deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. God cares about justice in the land. God God wants Christians to be involved in the civil realm. He wants us to put an end to the slaughter of innocents. He wants us to put an end to multi-generational theft of men and, and slavery. He wants us to be involved in those things. He wants us to stop oppression. It is not a virtue for Christians to say, well, I shouldn't get involved in politics while our brother is being murdered and oppressed and, and, and uh, destroyed. We need Christian civil magistrates. And he is the king. Jesus is the king of kings and the lord of lords and the sovereign over civil servants. So that's his role. Well, I think Peter, though, refers to this in Isaiah 53. In 1 Peter, he says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins and his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. See there, there's a a reference to 
uh, to living and, and righteousness. And it says that we've been returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. He is the righteous branch. He is the good shepherd. And he came to bear our sins in his own body and deliver us from the slavery of sin. Deliverance is one of the things the shepherd does. In fact, that's the theme of the next verses. It says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, As the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, then they shall dwell in their own land. Now he says, The day is going to come... They had, a, they had a, a blessing in those days. As the Lord lives that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, I'm telling you the truth. As the Lord lives that delivered us from Egypt. That's, that's the kind of swearing that they would do. And it like made its way. It was such a great event in their history that they would, they would uh, they'd, they'd swear by it. They'd, they'd talk by it. Probably to a sinful degree of, of uh, triviality. But they would say this, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. It was the greatest event in their history. They were slaves in the land of Egypt. They were oppressed. They, they, were, they weren't treated as sheep. They were treated as chattel property. And God raised up a deliverer a deliver to shepherd his people Israel, to bring them out of bondage, to bring them into the liberty, to bring them into green pastures, into the land of promise. That's what Moses did. He delivered them from slavery and he brought them in. That was the greatest event in their history and they talked about it frequently. Every Passover, what did they remember? Deliverance from Egypt. The Ten Commandments, every time it was quoted, the first of the Ten Commandments begins with the phrase, I am the Lord thy God that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. They talked about it constantly. But now a greater event has happened. What event? Christ came to deliver us from the slavery and bondage of sin, to be his own people, to be his own sheep. It is a greater deliverance. Christians don't speak constantly about deliverance from Egypt. We speak every Sunday about deliverance from sin. When we take communion, we don't take a Passover lamb and remember how they put the blood over the doorpost and God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you and killed all the firstborn of Egypt. What do we remember when we hold the body and the blood or or the bread and and the wine? What do we remember? We remember deliverance from sin. He shall be called Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. That is the exodus that we remember. He took us out of darkness and he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Having redeemed us with his blood. That's what he did. That's what he accomplished. Now, some people look at this and they believe it refers to a future time when Israel will supernaturally be gathered back to the promised land. And that may be also. I see, I see in Romans 11, it speaks of a day when Israel will be provoked to jealousy and will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as a whole. But I tell you what, I think we speak of this greater deliverance every time we use the word church. The word synagogue in the old, uh, means synagogue in Greek. It, it means like the, the gathered together. And at least two times in the New Testament, the meeting of the church is referred to as a synagogue. For example, James chapter 2 speaks of if if a poor man comes into your assembly, the word is basically synagogue, close to synagogue. Most of the time, though, we use the word church. And every time we use the word church, we speak of the gathering of God's chosen people. And it's made up of every tongue and tribe and nation. It is North American. It is South American. It is African. It is European. It is Asian. And if there's anybody in the Antarctic calling on the name of the Lord, they're part of it too. It's a universal church, a gathering of God's elect into one body, God's people. It's a greater event, and we speak of it every time we use the word church. So I put check mark fulfilled in that category. Well, it's 1201. I'll speak briefly about what comes next. I'll go hastily through it in verse 9. He says, concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome with wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. 
For the land is full of adulterers because of the curse. The land mourns and the pastures of the wilderness are dried up. Their course is evil and their might is not right. Both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their evil, declares the Lord. Therefore their way shall be to them like slippery paths in the darkness, and to which they shall be driven and fall. For I will bring disaster upon them in the year of their punishment, declares the Lord. He turns his attention to the prophets, which are a type of shepherd. They have a role to play. They're like maybe kind of like the sheep dog that barks and helps to direct the sheep. You know, sheep, sheep has his own little will, and he goes where he wants to go. But sheep bark, dog barks over here, roof, roof, roof. Sheep move over there. Sheep barks over here, roof, roof, roof. Sheep move over there. The prophet comes along and says, you're about to go off a cliff. And the wise in heart lay it to heart, and they say, I don't want to go off a cliff. I want to stay close to the shepherd. That's what the sheep dog does. Sheep dog helps to direct the flock where it needs to go. I see a problem over here. I see, I see danger. I see a low spot. You could fall and get upside down. And, and so the, the, at the command of the shepherd, the sheep dog barks. And the prophet's kind of like that. But here's the problem. When you've got really nice puppies leading the flock of God or coming along there, it's not good for the sheep. It's not good for the sheep. There, there, there is a need, and it's uncomfortable. I, I bet your average sheep doesn't like sheep dogs. Most sheep don't like sheep dogs because sheep dogs, they got teeth, right? They bark. But there is a need for the sheep dog in here. The prophet, the prophet tells them, you're violating the covenant of God. But some prophets are more interested in the sheep liking them than keeping the sheep from certain death. Verse 13, he says, In the prophets of Samaria I saw an unsavory thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. But in the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom and to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. He talks about two different types of prophets that are off base. The ones in Samaria up in the northern kingdom, they fell short in doctrine. Doctrine didn't matter to them. Truth didn't matter to them. They, they didn't care about truth. They didn't defend the sheep from false idolatrous doctrines. They led them after false gods of Baal. And the second ones in Jerusalem, they did care about doctrine. But look, they don't care about right living. And both right doctrine and right living are important. Why? Because ideas have consequences. An example fills a body. So he condemns those in Samaria because they're leading them into idolatry and false doctrine. And he condemns those in Jerusalem because they, they walk in lies Uh, They commit adultery, they walk in lies, and they strengthen the hands of evildoers. They won't deal with sin in the body. They want churches full of people, and they don't care about their spiritual condition. They're unwillingly to, to lovingly go and get in each other's business. Well, see, that's what the churches, that's what we're called to do. Now, we're to do it with humility. And something I've learned through the years, through mistakes and everything, Um, is that we need to really hear. You think you understand an issue. You think you can perceive an issue correctly, but doubt yourself. So when you go and reprove somebody, doubt yourself enough to say, okay, I really want to hear. Maybe doubt your eyes, doubt your ears, and, and hear. And when you sit down, every man who first tells their opinion seems right until another comes and cross examines him, right? And so, um, but there is a need for confrontation. But it should be done with humility, and we should assume that we don't know what we're looking at so that we come in a spirit of gentleness and humility and easily entreatable, and we gain our brother rather than push them further away. That's, a, that's an issue he has with them. They're, they're unwilling. The shepherds are unwilling to deal with sin and false doctrine in the church. I, I, I know this congregation, you want the truth. You want it both. You want sound doctrine, and you want the truth. Or, or else you, you, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't, you wouldn't come back. So um, I, I'm not reading any of this as, as, as if he's talking to America. He's talking to 8th century Israel. But you can't help but see applications, right? So verse 15, he says, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with bitter food and give them poison water to drink. For from the prophets of Jerusalem ungodliness has gone out into all the land. It... If you don't deal with sin, sin spreads. 
If you've got an infectious disease, a leprosy in the body, and you say, well, we love lepers. We want to show the lepers how much we love the lepers. Come here, all the lepers. Let's gather together. We don't judge sin. We don't judge at all. The problem is when you do that, you end up with the proliferation, the, the, the multiplication of leprosy. You have to love the flock enough to deal with it. And he says, well, they're unwilling to deal with it. And so sin has gone out from Jerusalem all over the land. It's infiltrated the whole land. All right. I'll go down to something happened there. Oh, well, I'll finish. I'm going to actually go to the last, last verse. I'm going to skip a bunch. Go to the last uh, verse in chapter 20, uh, 21 and 22. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. A good shepherd, well, number one, he's, he, unlike the false prophet, he's going to stand in God's presence. He's going to read God's word. He's going to hear from God, and he's going to turn his people from their sin. That's what, that's what God is looking for in his ministers, is to turn his people from his sin. Now, we could apply this. We could apply this in the civil realm. For time, I won't do that. We can apply it in the family for sure. We're not called to be our toddler's best friend. Now, that being said, play with your toddlers. Play with your children. Dads, get them up on your shoulders. Play with them. Swing them around. Play with them. But when it's time for discipline, you've got to love them enough to restrain evil. You've got to restrain evil. You can't let the toddler eat whatever they want and stay up as late as they want and do whatever they want and take whatever toy they want. You've got to restrain evil because our children have deceitful and desperately wicked hearts, Jeremiah 79, just like their parents do. They have to be restrained. There's a, there's a time to play with your children, and there's a time to spank your children. There, there's a time to encourage your children. There's a time to reprove your children. This generation of, of parents, it seems, so many, I, I'm not speaking of, of you per se, but this generation of parents, it's like, no matter what, you're just the best, you're the wonderful, you're the center of the attention. And then we, we raise these self-centered human beings, and surprise, they can't get along with their spouse who was raised the same way. They can't get along with anybody in the workplace because evil hasn't been restrained. That's true in the home. That's true in the civil, in the civil realm. We have, a, we have a state now that refuses to prosecute a variety of crimes. I mean, California is insane. It's insane. You can shoplift. You can go in someone's house. They can write them a ticket. They won't enforce the ticket. They won't even remove people from your house and your front lawn in California right now. That's how insane it is. The shepherds do not protect the sheep. So what do you have? You walk down sideways, sidewalks full of poop and needles. And people have tents on their front lawn. Well, in the church, what does that look like? When you have a church that doesn't teach sound doctrine and doesn't restrain evil, you get more of it. You get more of it. You got to deal with it. You do it lovingly. Servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle with all men. But it has to be done. In the home, in the civil realm, and, and in the church. And who's the example of that? Jesus. Jesus drove out the money changers. Jesus was not always nice. We are not called to be nicer than Jesus. Jesus was kind and loving and compassionate. But he also issued and decreed woes upon people that wouldn't hear the message. And people say, well, you know, he, he, he ate and drank with sinners. That's right. And he told them to repent. He calls us to repentance. That's our Jesus. And then he was willing to go and die for our rebellion and our transgressions and our iniquities. That's the shepherd we serve. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, that you love the sheep and you gave your life for us. We thank you that you are the Lord, our righteousness. Every time we speak of justification by faith, we we speak that we have the gift of your righteousness. That we are saved not by our wisdom or might or power. We are but dumb sheep. But we are saved by your grace. We are kept by your power. And we live according to your purposes and direction. 
Thank you, Father, for loving us, giving yourself for us, and electing us to be conformed to the image of your Son. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.